nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. We're privileged to have as our guest Dr. Thomas DiLorenzo, who has published more than a dozen books, somewhere in that neighborhood, and who is perhaps the nation's leading expert on one of the greatest scoundrels in American history, Abraham Lincoln. Now, how did you come to conclude that Lincoln was a scoundrel? <laughs> well, uh, Howard, I'm a free market economist and uh, a libertarian on, on, on most issues uh, that you could talk about on a show like this. And, uh, and I came to the belief that Lincoln was a, a, a nightmare for people who believe in free enterprise and constitutional liberty based on his actions, not his, not his pretty rhetoric. If you read his rhetoric, uh, like I tell people, even Bill Clinton will look like a great president if you judge him only by his rhetoric. But if you judge him by his act actions, you get a very different story. Well, as Eliza Doolittle said in My Fair Lady, words, 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 I'm so sick of words. Yeah. That's <laughs> all you writers can do. And that's all they could do. So you've written The Real Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Unmasked, and uh, other books uh, on uh, How Capitalism Saved America, Hamblin's Curse. What were the uh, most unconstitutional things that Lincoln did during his presidency? Uh, well, he started the war without the consent of Congress. He invaded his own country. He invaded his own country. You know, he took an oath to defend the Constitution, which means defending the, the liberties of the people and of, of course, his country. And of course, at West Point, uh, students were taught that secession was a right. That's and right. many states adopted the Constitution on condition that they could secede. That's right. That's right. If, if you were to look up the uh, Virginia ratifying document, uh, uh, they, they explicitly uh, uh, reserve the right to, uh, to, res to take back the powers delegated to the central government if in the future that government was abusive of their liberties. And, and a couple of other states did it also. And, of course, they were accepted into the Union with that contingency. And, uh, and uh, I, I believe that, that that meant that all the states assumed that they had those rights because the Constitution doesn't give one state more power or more privileges than, than any other state. And so, uh, yes, uh, there's a man named John Rawl, whose book was used at West Point before the Civil War, uh, who made the case for the, uh, why uh, secession was legal. And also, um, in 1860, the Congress uh, introduced several laws to make secession illegal. And I think that proves that they all knew that it was legal. Otherwise, otherwise why would they introduce legislation to, to make it illegal? And they never passed, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but then after the war was over, the Supreme Court, with the Lincoln appointees, uh, issued a statement that uh, it was uh, secession was I illegal and unconstitutional. But that was sort of uh, determined by, by bullets and not... Uh, not constitutional history. Well, let's not forget Lincoln, but while we're on the <clears throat> topic of secession, I think it's interesting that <clears throat> it's being seriously discussed in Vermont and the governor right. of Texas, right. Governor Perry, spoke about secession. And recently there was a League of the South meeting in South Carolina where secession was a major topic. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that something like this will happen, peaceful secession, and as you know, Howard, I've lost track, but about 37 states the last time I counted at least issued resolutions supporting the Tenth Amendment, uh, which had, does have uh, the right of a secession is not explicit in it, but I think it was assumed by the founders at the time that, of course, the states are sovereign, the people of the states are sovereign. Article 7 says that the way in which the Constitution is to be ratified is by uh, political conventions of the people of the states, and so they, they were the sovereigns, and I think it was just assumed at that time. And, uh, and I think uh, it's encouraging. I'd like to see it happen. I never thought 20 years ago that uh, we would see the peaceful secession of the Soviet Empire. That's how the Soviet Empire broke up, after all. Well, and, that's uh, how America so, started our secession from right. uh, Great Britain. That's right. Even before the word secession was commonly used, they used the word separation, uh, America was created by a war of secession. Uh, Timothy Pickering, the senator from your state, home state of Massachusetts, May God forgive what, me. What, what, what said that... Uh, <coughs> That it was the principle, with capital letters, the principle of the American Revolution was uh, secession or separation from the British Empire. Well, let's go back to Abe Lincoln. What were some of his other flaws as president? 
Uh, other flaws, well, you know, if, if anyone... Habeas would, corpus. Yeah, he, he illegally suspended, suspended the writ of habeas corpus, uh, and uh, at least 13,000 northern uh, citizens were imprisoned without due process because of that. And the, the legal community in the north, uh, of course, hated him for this, so much so that after the war, uh, a man named Frank O'Connor, who was a, a, uh, one of the most famous lawyers of his time, <coughs> Uh, offered to defend Jefferson Davis for free, uh, pro bono, uh, to get him out of prison, and, uh, which they did uh, in, uh, after he was imprisoned a after the war, because many of their clients, of course, were thrown into these dungeons, Lincoln's dungeons, without due process. And he tried to arrest the, the Maryland legislature. That's right. He did arrest many members of the Maryland legislature. He, arrested, he, he imprisoned the uh, mayor of Baltimore. Uh, a congressman named Henry May from Maryland, from Baltimore, Maryland, was thrown into prison without due process. And, of course, he uh, deported uh, Congressman Vallandigham from, from Ohio. Ohio. Sent him up to uh, Canada. He ended up uh, spending the rest of the war in Canada after after he was uh, uh, taken from his home. He closed down newspapers. He, he closed down, according to uh, James Randall, who was the, a preeminent Lincoln scholar of the last generation, uh, he closed down over 300 northern newspapers. In, uh, in some instances, the editors were thrown in prison and the pr printing presses were, were smashed. Have you seen the movie Gangs of New York? Yes, I have. Yeah. I liked that movie very much, and I was impressed with the fact that it revealed the degree of hostility to Lincoln among the citizens of New York. Oh, yes. I, there's a book called uh, Gang, uh, the, the Draft Riots of New York that part of that movie was based on. In fact, the author of the book was a uh, consultant to Martin Scorsese, who made the movie. And uh, uh, during some of the scenes, I recognized some of the scenes as very accurate uh, and, and in sync with the book. It was a Not great, all of it, of course. It's it, a Hollywood movie. It was but, a great uh, movie. What they did to the Irish immigrants was quite interesting, right. sending them down to toil for the Union right. and Pro get Promising killed. them free land if they joined the Army, uh, and they immediately sent them into the Battle of the Wilderness where they were, got eaten up in uh, Grant's meat grinder. Uh, well, that movie uh, interested me so much that I read a dozen books about uh, Five Points, that part of New York yes. City, oh, yes. uh, which was extant at the time. And, and uh, so much of the movie was accurate in terms of the names of the gangs, the mm -hmm. dead rabbits and all yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Boss Tweed got a bad rap. He was actually <laughs> not that bad a mayor yeah. and uh, did some good stuff. But yeah. uh, let's go on about Lincoln. Where, where um, else did he go astray? Uh, well, he, down, he, um, he was not the great liberator. Uh, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation only applied to areas over which he had no control. That's right. The, the, uh, you know, I visited um, Springfield, Illinois, a couple of years ago. I gave a speech there on Lincoln, and, uh, and uh, I got a standing ovation. It was the Illinois Libertarian Party, uh, and, uh, and but I visited uh, the Lincoln Presidential Museum, and uh, I was shocked that they have they have a big screen. And they had the, uh, the, the face of an ex-slave up there and uh, a man reading his words, the words of the ex-slave, calling uh, Abe Lincoln a hypocrite for issuing the Emancipation Proclamation because it didn't free anybody. Uh, the slaves understood, even they understood, that uh, it only applied to rebel territory, as, as the, uh, the document actually says. And so it didn't. And, you know, if anyone reads Lincoln's first inaugural address, he actually pledged his support for a constitutional amendment that would have forbidden the government from ever interfering in Southern slavery. Thirteenth Amendment, I think it was. It was. Yeah, the first, they call it the first Thirteenth Amendment, yeah. as some people do. It was also called the Corwin Amendment, named after a member of Congress. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the mainstream historians know about this. Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote about <laughs> it in her big uh, book, Team of Rivals. But uh, typically she makes excuses for it. Uh, I look at it and said, well, he, he did more than any other president did at that point to, to, uh, to write slavery into the Constitution, and that was an awful thing. Doris Kearns Goodwin says, no, that was a good thing because it was a slick political move that helped keep the Republican Party together. And that's, that's the theme of her book, of what a, what a slick conniver Lincoln was. And uh, he certainly was. I think of him as um, Bill Clinton times 10,000 in that regard. Well, uh, I don't think you've gone into it in your books, but I have no doubt that Lincoln was the son not of Thomas Lincoln, but of Abraham Enloe. And uh, that both Thomas Lincoln hated Abe, and Abe hated Tom, to the point where uh, Abe would not even go to Lincoln's funeral, which was down the street from his office cool. in Springfield. And uh, Lincoln did everything he could to uh, hold Lincoln back. There's a book called The Genesis of Lincoln, which has pictures mm 
of uh, Abraham Enloe's other children. They all look like Abe Lincoln. They all have the same afflictions, Marfan syndrome, etc. And uh, according to the book, and this was an issue in his 1860 presidential campaign, uh, Enloe's wife said, get rid of that uh, son of a gun, use a different word, uh, who had been, he had impregnated Nancy Hanks, who was herself illegitimate, her mother was illegitimate, and her mother's mother was illegitimate. <laughs> and so he hired Thomas Lincoln to bring uh, Nancy and little Abe to uh, Swain, to uh, uh, Kentucky, Hardin County, Kentucky, and uh, Enloe had lived in Swain County, Kentucky. We have to take a break here. There's so much we can say about Abe Lincoln. When we come back after these messages, we're going to talk about uh, one of Lincoln's heroes, not mine, Alexander Hamilton. Stay with us and Professor DiLorenzo. Tom Tancredo. You know, I just returned from a hearing on the southern border uh, in a place called Brownsville, Texas. One of the participants in the hearing told us that uh, for them, a border really doesn't exist between the United States and Mexico. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people have that attitude that there are no such things as borders, that they really don't matter, that they're just lines on a map and nobody should pay attention to them, and that we're all just residents of the North American continent. Well, you know what? That's baloney. It's baloney, but only if you will do something about it to prove to the people in, of this country, and especially to your elected officials, that you know borders matter. That you know the sovereignty of this country is at risk, and that you will take action to make sure that they understand it. That action is best taken by calling your local talk radio stations, writing letters to the editor, and of course, letting members of Congress know that you know. That's the best thing. It's their hoping, as a matter of fact, that no one really picks up on this issue of um, a, a North American trade association that essentially eliminates borders. But uh, the fact is it's happening. Uh, you can see parts of it all of the time. So it's something that we need to stop. Um, America, and I mean the United States of America, not the continent, but the United States of America is at stake. Do your part. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. We're privileged to have as our guest for this broadcast uh, Professor Tom DiLorenzo, who's written 13 excellent books on Abraham Lincoln and other topics. And one of the other topics is one of Abraham Lincoln's heroes, Alexander Hamilton. Another of Lincoln's heroes was Henry Clay, a truly evil man. As a matter of fact, uh, Lincoln gave the eulogy at Clay's funeral, if I'm correct. I recall he gave that. a eulogy. A eulogy. Yeah. But Alexander Hamilton is not uh, one of my heroes. I prefer Thomas Jefferson. You've written a book about Hamilton. I've not yet read it, but I'm sure it's excellent, just as your other books are excellent. Uh, they're The Real Lincoln, Lincoln Unmasked. And the book is called Hamilton's Curse. Right. What is Hamilton's curse? Well, well basically, the, the theme of the book is that uh, Hamilton and his political compatriots essentially wanted to bring the British system to America after the Revolution. They wanted a, a big centralized government with a permanent president, uh, effectively a king who would appoint all the governors and have veto power over state legislation. Uh, so essentially a British king, and they would use this power, this centralized power, uh, for economic purposes to create an empire that would uh, that would benefit primarily uh, the wealthier business class, uh, such as it was in America, mostly from New York, New England, where Did, Hamilton didn't was he do from. that by and, redeeming worthless currency and well, currency that, that worth, well, was worth well, that, a lot. Well, that was part of what, what Hamilton did with, yeah. uh, with the the nationalization of the debt. 
But the Jeffersonians uh, looked at this and, and said, essentially, uh, we just fought a revolution against that system. Why would we want to bring it here? And America had a battle for, uh, in, uh, in, as I see it, for about 70 years over this idea of, of bringing a centralized government that would uh, pursue empire like the British Empire to America. Jefferson himself thought that uh, this would be a mortal blow to American liberty, and he fought it tooth and nail every step along the way, and so as did his political descendants. But I think uh, the Civil War was sort of a breaking point where all these things Hamilton wanted uh, pretty much came into being uh, after the, uh, the 1865 era. And, of course, one of Hamilton's great allies was John Marshall. Right. Uh, who did great harm to our country as Chief Justice right, of the in, United in, States. In my book, uh, one of the chapters is entitled uh, Hamilton's Disciple, How John Marshall uh, Destroyed the Constitution. Uh, one of the things Marshall did is uh, he, he repeated Hamilton's, uh, uh, not even a theory, a superstition, that the states were never sovereign in order to justify centralized power of government. So in some of his key decisions, Marshall uh, was a pure Hamiltonian. He even quoted Hamilton verbatim in some of them in making uh, arguments for for uh, a broad interpretation of the Welfare Clause and the Commerce Clause, and uh, and, and you know how that turned out. And he basically it, it, said uh, the uh, Supreme Court owns the Constitution. We can tell right. you what it really means. Right. He, he was really saying uh, John Marshall owns the Constitution. When, when he said that we should have the right, the sole right to uh, for judicial review, he was saying John Marshall should. But it wasn't until after the Civil War, really, that uh, Americans seemed to think that the Supreme Court had the final word on constitutionality. Before that, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson, one of your favorite presidents, uh, Howard, uh, uh, when, when, when John Marshall said uh, the Bank of the United States is, is constitutional, Andrew Jackson essentially said, uh, well, thank you for your opinion, but my opinion is different. And on another different decision, Jackson said of Marshall, uh, Mr. Marshall has made his decision, but now let him try and enforce it. And so it wasn't at all accepted that there was only one branch of government that could uh, uh, issue uh, uh, statements on constitutionality. I, I love Andrew Jackson. What a great man he was. Uh, what a sense of honor he had. What courage he had. Uh, what leadership he showed. And his war against Mr. Biddle's bank, the second bank of the United States, saved us from uh, a national bank until 1913. Yeah, he, you know, he's portrayed by the liberal historians as a sort of a backwoods hick who was uneducated. But if you read some of his statements he made during the, the bank battle, he was very eloquent, and it sounds like Thomas Jefferson himself could have written some of his words uh, in his statement. And, and you're absolutely right. He, his instincts were, were right on that a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital could do nothing but mischief and, and cause trouble. And he had to have known that the Bank of the United States, when it was created in 1791, Hamilton's Bank, uh, created 72 percent inflation in the first five years, and it immediately began corrupting politics as well. And, uh, and uh, so Jackson, that was one of the great things he did was to veto the rechartering of Hamilton's Bank. And of course, Lincoln, who we talked about earlier, was uh, uh, in favor of resurrecting that bank or some version of it for his entire political career. And I, that's why I call him the political son of Alexander Hamilton. He, he was on line with uh, all of Hamilton's uh, you know, pe uh, People program. think of the Republican Party as historically the conservative party. But if you look at its origins, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, Alexander Hamilton, Abraham Lincoln, I mean, they were for, quote, unquote, internal improvements which set us off on the wrong course, yeah. totally unconstitutional. Right. And uh, the Republican Party has been the corrupter of the Constitution since the very beginning. It, it, it has. The, the Democratic Party, uh, until the late 19th century, was the party of the Jeffersonians. That, that was the, uh, uh, where the, the, the people who really believed. And uh, One of my articles in, on the web on lewrockwell.com was about Grover Cleveland, I called him the last good de Democrat. He was a great man. And he was, a, he was the last Jeffersonian president uh, we had. He was he a great man. He wasn't perfect. Uh, when I say these things, I get emails and letters from people saying, well, what about this one thing he did yeah. on September 29th of some, some, yeah. some day? Well, none that, of that's us not is the perfect. point. None right. of us is perfect. But he was a man who tried to honor the Constitution of the United States. But he's the last one. Uh, the Democratic Party <laughs> changed uh, after that. It was taken over by the progressives and then eventually the...
the socialist, uh, I would say, under uh, Roosevelt. Yeah, and of course, and, and uh, Republicans always were the party yeah, of big government yeah, for the benefit of big yeah. business. William Jennings Bryan had some conservative instincts. Uh, he was very upset with the Federal Reserve producing unbacked currency. And he tried to talk Wilson out of it, mm -hmm. but he did not succeed, and yeah. he resigned yeah. his position. Yeah, yeah. Coolidge and Harding weren't too bad. Uh, I think uh, the great H.L. Mencken once said, listening to a Calvin Coolidge speech is like listening to mad dogs barking all night long. But, but, but he still, I think he still was a pretty good president. He didn't, he didn't get us into any unnecessary wars. <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't explode the budget. And he was a pretty conservative president. But, uh, but apart from that, the Republicans don't have a good record yeah. as in limiting government. In his personal life, uh, Harding was very similar to Bill Clinton. Yes. Uh, he had many of the same peccadilloes and sins of which Clinton was guilty. But as president, uh, he was not nearly so bad as the historians say he was. Well, they say he was bad because he didn't expand government as much as the, the <coughs> history profession would like to see government expanded. That's, that's the way they, they usually rank presidents in terms of how big a war they get us into and how much they s increase spending by. And Teddy Roosevelt was the opposite. He was a great man in his private life, but he was a horrible president in terms of expanding the government yeah. and having the government do all kinds of unconstitutional things. Yeah, he reminded, reminds me a lot of Herbert Hoover. Uh, he was sort of a thought of himself as a social engineer. Hoover literally was an engineer, a mining engineer, and he thought human beings and society in general could be engineered by you know, smart at, people like himself. That's at the, the 1940 Republican National Convention, Herbert Hoover, according to reports, had learned his lessons, the things he had done wrong that basically were precursors of what FDR did in the Great Society. And he was going to give a great speech uh, criticizing himself, criticizing FDR-style policies, and, uh, and opposing U.S. intervention in World War II, and uh, critiquing Wen Wendell Wilkie. But Wilkie's people turned off the microphone. They screwed up the microphone so no one could hear what Herbert Hoover had to say. Mm. And what was to have been his shining moment uh, became a moment of extraordinary yeah. frustration. Yeah, some of his speeches that I've read after... You know, after he retired from politics, are very, very good. Very, you know, any conservative would like them. Yeah. But as president, he was a big interventionist. Yeah. It is true that Roosevelt simply picked up where he left yeah. off I in, remember in going, starting the New Deal. I went to the Hoover uh, Presidential Library in West Branch, Iowa, I guess it was, and that was. And I read. I spent a day or two there, and I read much of what Hoover had done, and I came to realize. Uh, what a real liberal he had been as president yeah. and in his private life in uh, World War I and during the 20s yeah, and, and so gen forth. Generations of school children have been told a lie that yeah. Herbert Hoover was an advocate of laissez-faire yeah. and that's what caused the Great Depression. It is a lie. He wasn't. He was a, he was a big interventionist. I had the privilege of meeting Hoover at a YAF convention, I think in 1960, and I had a nice chat with him. But uh, uh, one last thing before we go to our break. We're overdue on the break. Harding had an extraordinary cabinet. He had Andrew Mellon as Treasury yes. Secretary. Uh, he had Charles Evans Hughes as his Secretary of State, et cetera. The whole cabinet was made up of exemplary, renowned individuals. And uh, he may have been, you know, the weak uh, person at the top of the, uh, of the huddle. Mm -hmm. But he had attracted some extraordinary people to serve in his cabinet. Yeah, and uh, and Mellon was a great Treasury Secretary. He, he did a lot to create the boom of the of the early 1920s. There was a, you know there was a depression in 1921, but it ended very quickly because they essentially did nothing and they let the markets adjust. There was no big intervention, but that was the last depression we had in America, where the government didn't. Uh, become a hyper-interventionist yeah. in response and make things worse as it did during the Great Depression. Well, Tom, you know so much we could continue uh, this conversation forever, but I've got to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages. Yes, I am a... Uh want to say and encourage people to watch Howard Phillips and the Conservative Roundtable. I have great respect for Howard Phillips, and I know he is a man that speaks the truth. He's worth watching. Welcome back. Our guest has been my good friend, Dr. Tom DiLorenzo.
who's a professor of economics at uh, Loyola University, uh, who has published 13 excellent books. I've read some of them. And uh, his most recent book is called Hamilton's Curse. Before we get into Hamilton's Curse, let me just tell you, if you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. If at no cost you want to receive some of our publications and literature, uh, fax us your name and address at 703-281-4108, or you can snail mail us at TCC, the Conservative Caucus, 450 Maple Avenue East, uh, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Tom, tell us about Hamilton's Curse. There have been a lot of books written about Alexander Hamilton, a couple of them in the last several years. What makes your book different and worth reading? Uh, well, he was the founding father of central banking, the founding father of uh, crony capitalism, uh, the founding father of the idea that we should have a large public debt. And that's why when the book came out in October, last October, uh, I immediately got on MSNBC, the, the Morning Joe show, because the press release from Random House uh, explained how this is really the origins, these ideas uh, of Hamilton's, of the current economic crisis. And uh, I tell the story of how there was a battle over these ideas uh, for, for decades and decades in America, and we finally became a, a Hamiltonian country. I quote George Will as saying, we, Americans like to quote Jefferson, but we live in Hamilton's country, essentially. And I agree with that, and, but I, I call it a curse on America because he was also the founding father of constitutional subversion. He invented the idea of implied powers of the Constitution during his debate with Jefferson over the Bank of the United States, for example. And so uh, I think that's why I call it a curse. And my book ba is based mostly on Hamilton's economic and political ideas. It's not a biography, per se. <coughs> Read the book, Hamilton's Curse, by Dr. Tom DiLorenzo. Tom, thank you for joining us on Thanks this podcast. Thanks for having me, Howard. We really appreciate it.